Hi, um, so my name is Jenna and I am here with the wonderful Ollie Blake. We're in LA and we are here to talk about uh, some of her writing, some of her just like personality, just all kinds of things, lots of fun stuff. The first question I have to ask you is like kind of embarrassing, but I don't know how to pronounce your actual name. Oh, my actual name? Yeah. Oh, that. Yeah, yeah that, that thing. <laughs> it's Alexine, like Alexis. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so last year you were like, I would say virtually unknown in the publishing world. Right. You were a little bit like underground. I mm -hmm. feel like everybody who knew about you was like deeply underground. Tumblr and like the dark places of the internet and mm -hmm. now you're like kind of publishing royalty. I would um uh, that feels uncomfortable. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to walk just around it. Okay. Yeah. Well, you're still kind and, of a big deal. Right. So we're going to move from underground to like slightly slightly above ground. Yeah, like you're groundhog. Like seeing, seeing the sun. Yeah. You're just a mm -hmm. coming out of the hole. <laughs> What has that journey been like, like emotionally or any of that? Oh, coming out of my cage and yeah. I've been doing just fine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> For me, it just mostly makes the most sense to focus on the work. Mm -hmm. So I'm actively writing the Atlas yeah. series right now. Mm -hmm. um, my husband is a teacher and he's on summer vacation. So this fine. is my chance yeah. to actually work mm -hmm. and not be the full-time goblin, goblin handmaid. Right, 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 right. It's actually been very easy to ignore uh, nice. most of what's going on. Good. Yeah, <laughs> my social media apps are silenced during the day, so it's mostly like, it's pretty you normal. Just, you just exist. It's actually like, you know, it's very mundane yeah, from day to day. It, <laughs> There's a child who prevents me from sleeping yes. and it's a very yeah. grounding experience. Mm -hmm. So I know I, I I know you started from like the fan fiction side of things. Oh, I um, is that, how, how did fan fiction kind of encourage you to like create your own stuff? Or write your own worlds. So fan fiction is very crowd pleasing. Yes. Like the the point of fan fiction is to please your audience. And if you're mm -hmm. the kind of fan fiction creator that's writing for yourself, you're the audience. That's easy right. to do. Yeah. Um, but I got into this um, thinking like, you know, I've had this story in the back of my mind since I was 16. Yeah. And like, it turns out fan fiction is a thing. So I guess I'm gonna write it. Yeah. Um, it was like a, you know, I was like had insomnia and couldn't mm -hmm. sleep and just started Same. publishing <laughs> on the yeah. internet. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden it's like whoa, there's a comment, somebody read yeah. this, like five people have read this. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. it's so like world realigning. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was writing, not thinking about the fact that fan fiction, like many mediums, has its own rules, you right. know, that yeah. you, you can only do certain things. People right. come into it expecting, um, well, fandom, first of all, is a very safe place. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, I think it's at the forefront of like trigger warnings and, yes. and uh, you know, tags and tropes. Mm -hmm. I think it's very fan fiction driven to recognize those yeah. things. And um, I am not necessarily interested <laughs> in yeah. in um writing two tropes right yeah. um or and and i was doing a lot of subverting things mm -hmm. so people would come in expecting one thing and then be very mad right. that that yeah. wasn't what they got mm -hmm. and um yeah if there's one thing i've had a lot of practice with negative reviews <laughs> Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, especially because in fan fiction, like mm -hmm. this thing you're doing for free and for fun, right. people love to tell you the yeah. many myriad mm -hmm. of ways that you're yeah. doing it wrong and like are probably a criminal. Mm -hmm. So I started to realize like, maybe I need to tell my own stories. Maybe the problem here is that I, I'm breaking too many rules uh, in a yeah. way that's in a way that's like disrespectful to the audience. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like how um, romance romance with a capital R, that genre, yeah. always has a happy ending. It yeah. has a pattern mm -hmm. for a reason right, yeah. because it's a comfortable, safe space. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so I was like, well, if I'm going to break rules, then I have to leave here. Yeah. Like, I, like I have to, I was still like splitting my time. I was writing fan fiction mm -hmm. for fun because, you know, it was fun. Yeah, of and, <laughs> and then um, before the source material got undeniably problematic, right, it was yeah. fun. Mm -hmm. And then um, writing my self-published books that were mm -hmm. stories that like I just wanted to tell, yeah. but I didn't think had a lot mm -hmm. of marketable marketability. Yeah. My first book, Masters of Death, was about mm -hmm. a vampire in a time when all agents were like, don't send no us vampires. vampires. Yeah. We, mm -hmm. It will be deleted unread. Like multiple <laughs> agents said that. Yeah. So, Yikes. um yeah. <laughs> and yet here we are and, and it's going to be are. published. I so know, who knows? I know. Who knows? So, so there are no rules, yeah. whatever. I feel like that's just like your whole brand is like, you're like, yeah. I can do anything and somehow like <laughs> yeah. it works out. Everything is pointless. <laughs> Nothing matters. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so then self-published books and then I was writing stuff that I thought was 
to the market mm -hmm. to the extent that you can predict the market, yeah. which you can't. You can't, yeah. No. You can't. Mm -hmm. In negative and positive ways, yeah. you can't. Um, but I was trying. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just splitting myself many, many ways. I um, I have no idea what the question was. But, I don't either, yeah. but okay. we went down this great yeah, journey so together. Did. Bringing it back to like self-publishing, because mm -hmm. obviously like, I found you when you were still self-published, not yes, to like you brag. Did. Yes, um, you did. But like, what was so fascinating to me is that like, you had just so many really like, I guess unmarketable ideas to like most people, yes. but also like when I was reading through them, I was like, whoa, like the Alexandria Library, <laughs> like we're gonna bring that to, like I'm honestly kind of shocked that nobody wrote about that in the way that you did, I guess. Before. Yeah, I mean, I think my my secret here mm. is that I thought this was unmarketable because it was derivative. Like oh, my thought yeah. was, people have done the Library of Alexandria mm -hmm. before. There's the um, oh, the there's a bunch of books that I, of course, can't think of the titles right, of right now. So certainly, the Library of Alexandria has been done before, mm -hmm. and even like the first chapter is everyone has talked about the, yes. <laughs> the yeah. very mm -hmm. first chapter yeah. is, this is a very common idea. Right. Right, right, right. Um, and it was mostly that I was trying to build my world in the sense of, I want to focus on six people and mm -hmm. these very like ethically problematic stakes yes. and, and what that says about the world and mm -hmm. about academia, et cetera. And so I was like, oh, the Library of Alexandria. Sure. Of course, yeah. like what else would, would I, what else would there be? And so I think it's so funny when people are like, what a revolutionary yeah. start. I mean, like, it, I think it's revolutionary. The reason, I mean, thank you. Yes. I do, I think that um, I approach it in an unconventional way, yeah, in, in a very human character driven mm -hmm. way. But the reason that I thought that it wasn't marketable and wouldn't succeed uh, like querying agents yes. was because I think that when you pitch it, it sounds like something you've read before. Yeah, it kind of um, does. Yeah. It, it, it's there like, has been like, a, and I feel like because it's like, dark academia or whatever mm -hmm. like that's like so hot right now and it's like I feel like it's coming towards the end of that era I, th I think it's it's more like um, because dark, dark academia has become something that you can point to and right. say that's dark academia it's yeah. it's starting to feel a little bit like the paranormal romance era yes. yeah. where it's, it's just, just like saturated. well this is yes oversaturated mm -hmm. for sure yeah. which is kind of sad actually yeah. I, I was talking to Victoria Lee who mm -hmm. wrote A Lesson in Vengeance yeah, which is book. excellent yes excellent, excellent. Um, approached very differently than mm -hmm. I did, but yeah. very still super great. good. Yeah, yeah. still mm -hmm. true with that psychological thriller yeah. like spirit. Um, but she was, we were talking about how uh, the Atlas Six, because I would self published it and released it really early on. Mm -hmm it seemed like I was ahead of the trend when really right. she had written that book first and it came oh, out after. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So to me, I thought I was already behind. Yeah. That I thought I was already like, oh, lots of other people had done this. Mm -hmm. um, Naomi Novik's book had been already been announced. Yeah. Um, Ninth House had been announced. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, then there's no point in me querying right. this. Yeah. And in so doing. <laughs> And here we are. <laughs> Beat them to the punch. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> so. Crazy. Talking more about the Atlas Six, I know you were kind of a little bit talking about like how the idea started, but like what, like what was the spark that you were like, I got to, was it like writing about the six people or like how did you, how did this book come to be? <laughs> I was trying to decide whether it was ethical to have a baby. This was a yeah. conversation I had been having with my husband. <laughs> many times. Mm -hmm. And it was like a really weird back and forth where I was like, I don't know about the world. Yeah. And he was like, but we have a, you know, we have to preserve the species. And I was like, but do we? Do we though? Do we? <laughs> and, <laughs> and he would, and I was like overpopulation and he'd counter with like just one child and, you know, and it was, yeah. this, and so I was in this place of, I wanted a baby, mm -hmm. um, but I also wasn't sure I could justify bringing Bring a human life into yeah. a world that's crap. Right. Um, and I still am not sure that I made the right choice. Yeah. That's fair. It's not but right, right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, but those that's where I was mentally when mm -hmm. I was putting together this story and I was thinking about it in terms of what do we do um, if we feel like the world is going to end mm -hmm. and and how do you know how do we save it and I kind of went backwards in my thought experiment yeah. of like it's never about the world really. Yeah. It's really just about other people mm -hmm. and, and the specific people in your life yeah. that change you and change your motivations and mm -hmm. they're what make up the world. Yeah. And so I wanted to have these really big driving questions mm -hmm. that always brought came back to yeah. the same six people. Yeah. I wanted to lean into that pulpy aspect of it yeah. too. That's, um, that it has the, I talk about how it has the conceit of like the bachelor or the real world yes, where it it's just like <laughs> these people in a claustrophobic mm -hmm. environment, but that's part of it. Yeah, it is. That is the world. Do you have like 
one of the six that you favor above the others? Or like somebody you really enjoyed writing? I don't, and I purposely try not to. Yeah. You know, at any point where I feel like I, I'm leaning too close to one, mm -hmm. I assume that the audience is probably doing the same thing, yeah. which is not true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but in my head, I'm like, you know, if I feel too strongly about one, then I need to do something to make the others, you know, more yeah, interesting. Balance it out. My husband says that he thinks I'm Reyna, which is funny. I don't know why. <laughs> I um, can see that. A little bit. <laughs> what I. Little. I I love that people are like, we don't see enough of Reyna in book one. And I'm like, that's because Reyna's not going to show you who you who she is in book yeah. one. Like, you've only known her for a year, right. okay? You yeah. got you have that's to see, fair. you have to spend more time with Reyna before yeah. she's ready to tell you about her past. I'm excited to hear about Reyna's past, honestly. I, yeah. <laughs> I'm very excited. Yeah, and um, so I think, yeah. You know, there are days when writing Callum feels perfect. Yeah. That, that's like, fair. that's that's the mood mm -hmm. that I'm in. And yeah. then there are days when I feel very in touch with Libby mm -hmm. and... So it's just kind of a... Uh, Everybody. Yeah, I do. I will say that I personally think Tristan's point of view is the funniest. Yeah, he does have a really funny point yeah. of view. Yeah. Um, he's a great so, guy. Yeah. They're all great, but he's a great guy. They're all great and they're also all terrible. <laughs> exactly, and that's humanity right yes. there. I know for a while there, it was like kind of uncertain if you were gonna be able to do the full trilogy. And then like obviously like everything happened yes. and now you're doing yeah. all three books and whatever. Mm -hmm. Was there any point where you were like, I have to like restructure everything and like cut things down and like, or ha have you like kind of stuck with the plan since the beginning? I think that because I started in fan fiction, I'm always thinking about my audience mm -hmm. and my audience is like a ghostly person in the chair yeah. next to me. And um, so after I self-published the Atlas Six, I almost immediately after got my agent and sold my young adult manuscript, mm -hmm. which is now the book, My Mechanical Romance. Yeah. And so I was like, oh God, maybe I'm, maybe I'm a young adult writer. Like maybe yeah. they're not gonna be okay with me continuing to self-publish the, yeah. these like darker fantasy right. things. And so um, the the option to not finish the series was never on the table. I was always gonna finish it because like I, yeah, you got, I mean, I have to, gotta, I wasn't going to leave the series right. unwritten. That was not going to yeah. happen. But I thought like, well, maybe the quickest way for me to do it, like, mm -hmm. is my agent going to be mad if I continue churning out a trilogy? So I was yeah. like, maybe I'll just restructure to a duology. But yeah. then like the second book would be way too long. Because yeah. like, you know, I intentionally wrote act one. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you had a plan. Yeah. <laughs> you got to stick with it. Um, <laughs> Not much of a plan, but enough that I knew that I had only built 30% of the story. Yeah. And yeah, and uh, so it was really fortunate then. I didn't, there's some books, like Alone With You in the Ether, I didn't necessarily want to traditionally publish. Yeah. I'm going to because um, for, you know, operations reasons yeah. that yeah. like the production will be better mm -hmm. and more people can have it if they want it, more translations yeah. and audio and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but the Atlas Six, I jumped at the chance because I was like, good, now it's my job to yeah. finish this. I have to do it. <laughs> no, like, good. I want it. And I like really rushed through my production deadlines because yeah. I was like, people have been waiting for a long yeah. time. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's it was a really... Um, yeah, it was just so fortuitous. Yeah. Uh, my, my feelings on traditionally publishing this particular mm -hmm. book were like, yes, yes, yes this is, that. that's what needs to happen. Has it been different writing? Because I, I know you wrote, you're writing the third one obviously after you've been published. I think you were writing the second one after you got published too. So how, how has writing those two books been different than like the beginning when it was still going to be self-published and you didn't have a deal and you were just like a lowly yeah. writer in your yes, room? Yes. <laughs> a lowly, yeah. I, I always say that I was trying to be a writer, which looked a lot like failing to be a writer. Yeah, it's one of all creative careers. You're just waiting on like one phone call, mm -hmm. you know, and you it's you go into it so blind. It's yeah. not like you don't see the ladder that you can climb. It's yeah. just you're like, on or off. Like, yeah, I'm, yeah. <laughs> so definitely, book one came from a very frustrated like this is probably going nowhere. Whatever, maybe yeah. five people will read it kind right. of place. And then book two, I started writing, stopped when I sold uh, my mechanical romance because I was like, oh, well, I can't do it right now yeah. anyway. I'll come back to it. And then by the time I was coming back to it, there were all these expectations. Mm -hmm. um, it was being optioned for TV. It was this whole thing. Yeah. I went from being, you know, nobody's heard of her to, oh my God, she's so she's overhyped. So overhyped. <laughs> Within a week, I would say. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, and so that was the mood going into book two was like, oh my God, I cannot... Like, I, I feel like a con artist, yeah. but I have to continue on the heist. Right. Like, at this point, I'm, I'm in keep, too deep. Yeah, you gotta keep going. And I have no time, and I've got an infant who mm -hmm. doesn't sleep, and I just have to, like, write it as fast as I can because I don't, I, whatever. And so yeah. that was actually, it was kind of a great experience because there were 
there were many expectations, but also no expectations. Because, yeah. like, who loves book two? You know, like, book two is book two. It's, uh, you, you take, yeah. like, yeah. book one and book three, those are the, those are the those memorable are the ones. ones. Yeah, two is like. Book two is like, just don't bore us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the pretty ba- base expectations. Yeah, there. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, all right, I'm just not going to be boring. Yeah. Um, and I'm just going to write it. Yeah. So that turned out surprisingly well. Well, good. That, that I was like, I feel yeah. very good about book mm-hmm. two. And then going into book three, I'm like, okay, now I know what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, and it's so hard. <laughs> I believe it. I do not want to be in <laughs> this is This is the hardest, this is the hardest experience I'm having so far, for sure. Well, you know, I'm sure it'll, it'll hopefully work out. It'll happen. <laughs> it'll happen. There was like a song that you think would describe just like, any part of the trilogy, the whole trilogy, one book, just like a song that you want to recommend that would be like, this is like an Alice Six song that I think everybody should listen to. Well, it's probably the best by AWOL Nation. Okay. But for book two, I was, I was just listening to the Atlas Paradox playlist. Nice. (laughs) And I, um, I would say the song Sadder, Badder, Cooler by Toba Low. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Very interesting vibe. I don't have anything to sum up book three yet. That's fair. Um, how far did you say you are in that? Uh, Eighty-four thousand words. Okay. Which for a first draft is is pretty far in the yeah. the the la, like I think the Atlas Six was about one hundred thirty thousand words. Okay. The Atlas Paradox a little bit more than that. Yeah. Um, so I'll probably end the first draft around 100 and then it will just get much larger. Yeah, obviously. Okay, switching gears a little bit. So I know you have like first of all, you just have like a lot of things in the works coming out just like all over the place. Cause I was like looking mm-hmm. at your website yesterday and I was like, I didn't even like know half of these things were announced, but like there's some like, you've got a lot of cool stuff coming out. I do, yeah. Um, and I know you have it split between kind of like your YA and your adult stuff. Um, but I feel like most of your adult stuff is very like sci-fi fantasy kind of yes. vibes. Mm-hmm. Is that, or is, is that something that you're gonna stick with or do you ever see yourself kind of doing more like alone with you in the ether? again not again but you know like yeah. swapping over genres doing different things is that something you're interested in? or like with YA I feel like crossing over to like YA fantasy any of that sort um of I wouldn't write YA fantasy only because I can't do that pacing mm, um you know the fair. smaller word counts the things yeah. <laughs> the things that happen much faster for mm-hmm. me the reason I enjoy fantasy is because I give fantastical settings a very grounded human element yeah. mm-hmm. and that's just a lot of words yeah. <laughs> that's a lot of like what's Tristan thinking about yeah. right now <laughs> <laughs> which does not work for YA, and yeah. that's why I wouldn't write YA fantasy. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do write YA romance because the, your whole job in romance yeah. is to develop a character, mm-hmm. um, and that's what I like to do. Yeah. But uh, Alone With You in the Ether is essentially going to be shelved under speculative now, although it's literary, yes. because it's Tor, and it's got right. we're leaning into that very speculative mm-hmm. soul, which yeah. is you know, unexpected. I feel like that's the heart of kind of what you do. Yes, in yeah, adult, yes. Um, I think I just don't like to set limits on what could be true Mm -hmm. so even if we're not in a world where anything could happen we still in in my world in my view of the world Mm -hmm. anything is technically possible so for with alone with you in the ether it revolves around someone who's trying to solve time travel Mm -hmm. but the actual mechanisms of time travel are not relevant it's just why he's doing it yeah um so yeah so i i occasionally have plot ideas like that yeah. where it's not necessarily about magic or about how the magic works mm-hmm. um but the from the viewpoint that maybe everything is possible and yeah. maybe it's just like it broadens the world that way or opens yeah. it up speaking of alone with you in the ether which great book definitely recommend it um i was so fascinated by the writing style for that book <laughs> and i feel like you're probably going to answer this question a million times whenever it comes out but like i really truly want like how did you come up with that like what is that writing style because <laughs> it's like if you haven't read it it's basically like there's just so many different i don't even know how to explain it you just jump into a lot of different voices and there's like some narration sometimes it feels like you're reading like a screenplay mm-hmm. sometimes it's just prose like it's just like all over the place but like in a good way yeah well, I wanted it to feel like you're inside the experience of a mental disorder. Oh, so, cool. um, and a mood disorder specifically. Mm-hmm. So in the beginning of the book, there's lots of, there's the movie action cues mm-hmm. and the narrators because I wanted it to feel like you're watching through a lens, that yeah. these characters are observing themselves mm-hmm. through someone else's lens. And yeah. there's this disconnect between who they want to be and who mm-hmm. they're capable of being. Yeah. Um, and then sort of the more they get in touch with themselves, um, mm-hmm. you see that in good and bad ways. So you can see like the racing thoughts, the intrusive thoughts. Yeah. Regan especially has a lot of intrusive thoughts. Yes. 
um, and they they come in the form of like her mother's voice or mm -hmm. something, you know. And I to me that was that was the experience. Mm -hmm. um, I'm bipolar, and that, that is my experience. Yeah. You know, you have I have that really mean voice in my head, mm -hmm. and I wanted to. Um, I not honor that voice, right. but uh, I wanted that voice to be present, mm -hmm. and uh, but also the feeling of like when you're actually that sense of synchronicity when you are yourself and you mm -hmm. feel yourself, and um, but also looking at it from the outside yeah. when they're watching each other, being right. like, uh oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that you'd be in one person's perspective and see how like exuberant they feel, mm -hmm. and then switch to the other person, being like, uh oh, what is yeah. happening? Yeah. That just felt, yeah, yeah. No, for sure. And I think one of the things I, I mean, I really appreciated about it was I love like your acknowledgement section. Cause like that whole, like, just like talking about your experience and your relationship and like all that sort of stuff. Cause obviously it's not like, it's really not like a biographical no, book by yeah, any yeah. sense, but it's like drawn from personal right. The events are not true, but the, the, the experience, the voice is yeah, what's, the yeah. How are you coping with the idea that now it's going to be like oh really public? <laughs> yeah. So, um, when I was at the Atlas Sticks, like launch event, mm -hmm. uh, when it came out at Barnes and Noble in the Grove, um, I have a friend there, Renee, he's, the <laughs> he's the buyer who found it when it was self-published oh, and amazing. stocked it. Yeah. yeah. So, um, he, I was, someone had brought alone at the in the ether for me to sign. And mm -hmm. I was like, Oh, like, I'm so happy. This means something yeah. to you. Like this is one that, you know, I'm kind of hoping this doesn't go viral yeah. or anything. Cause it's so personal. Mm -hmm. And he leaned over and was like, I regret to inform you, it is already viral. Yeah. And I was like, oh, no. no, like I'm not emotionally prepared for yeah. that at all. Yeah. Um, I guess it's kind of a relief then that the Atlas Six went viral first so yeah. I could become accustomed Prepare. to the, mm -hmm. you're overhyped and don't understand how yeah. to write a book mm -hmm. um, with something that wasn't so personal. Yeah. Um, because certainly it feels different when people are like, alone with you, the ether <laughs> is bad or yeah. it's nothing <laughs> special. I love that. That's, that's Love that. I highly disagree with that, but you know, it's fine. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> books are books are written by a human yeah. and read by a human. Right. So it's going to be special to some people and mm -hmm. not at all to others. Yeah. And that's fine. Yeah. And that's what the experience is. I'll just do like some like quick, like little rapid yeah, fiery sure. ones. Uh, are what are like writers or authors that have had like the biggest impact on your writing? I think V. Schwab, mm -hmm. Neil Gaiman, uh, that's they feel uh, like the fantasy that I'm writing. Yeah. Elna Ferrante is my favorite. Mm -hmm. uh, Zadie Smith. Yes. Um, so in that like literary vein mm -hmm. of, well, Elena Ferrante's Angry Women and Zadie Smith's sort of like sense of humor about mm -hmm. the world, her yeah. like absurd way of looking at it. Yeah. Uh, these are, I think that's what I'm essentially trying to combine the yeah. fantasy settings mm -hmm. with the, yeah. The literary ish. Yeah. yeah the, well, and also, oh, uh, um, Rachel Cusk's Outline Trilogy. Oh, yeah. I think yeah. that's really good. It's really, well, it's a lot like the Atlas Six in mm -hmm. that um, the narrator doesn't say anything really. That, mm -hmm. Like you're observing other people around them. Yeah. And, you know, when she does it, it's brilliant. Right. When I do it, it's, it's pacing problems. Overhyped. <laughs> yeah, you know? Is there like a book that you wish you'd written? Oh, I mean, certainly White Teeth by Zadie Smith is yeah. just like, it's so good. It's so brilliant. Yeah. Recently, though, I read Fault Lines by um, Emily Itami, and it's a uh, contemporary, it's it's not romance, so I guess it's, I guess it's women's fiction. Uh. It's about a woman's life. Yeah. Um, and it's it's just incredible. Like, right from the start, you know you're reading something special. Yeah. So. I know you have, like, a newsletter where you kind of, like, or, like, on your website, too, you'll, like, recommend things that you're, like, reading mm -hmm. or whatever. And I know you have updated that recently, but, like, what are some, like, recommendations you have of, like, recently that you're, like, ah, this sticks yes. out. People need to. Um... Light from Uncommon Stars by okay. Rika Yoki. Okay. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yeah. Um, we happen to share an editor, nice. but but it's excellent. I feel like it's it ha it gave me the same feeling that um, The House in the Cerulean Sea by T.J. Klune oh, gave yeah. me, mm -hmm. but um, with a lot more Asian food. So mm. delicious. I was yeah. starving, and good. also music. So mm -hmm. it was just really. Um, yeah, the the depth of it. It was and yeah. it was clever and good. Fault lines. I just I'm gonna push fault lines because okay. I feel like a lot of book talk is really into you know Emily Henry yes. and and Colleen Hoover mm -hmm. and, and obviously very good. Right. But like people should be talking about Emily Atami. All right, I didn't put that on my list. Absolutely. <laughs> What's a book that you think everybody should read? The, the Neapolitan novels. I think. Okay. I, uh, yeah, and I think my 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 the opposite of that, the book that like not everybody should read, but only certain people, okay. uh, <laughs> is um, Her Fearful Symmetry by Audrey Niffenegger. Okay. That's one of my, she, so she wrote The Time Traveler's Wife, mm -hmm. and lots of people who pick up 
her fearful symmetry don't realize how strange she actually is. Yeah. <laughs> um, so she gets real weird in that book. Mm -hmm. And I think if you're ready for it, you love it. But yeah. So it's like, oh my God, this is really unexpected. Yeah. And if you're not... <laughs> you're not. <laughs> <laughs> so what would be the best advice you would give to yourself right after you self-published your first book? I mean, I actually think that I did it right yeah. in terms like if you want to be su successful self-publishing you mm -hmm. just have to come out with as many books as you can because you you build up a pipeline yeah. you're not gonna get like the one book that really sells a bunch right. it's gonna be um, people stumble upon one book and then they see the rest of yeah. your uh, back catalog mm -hmm. and I think there's a reason the Atlas 6 wasn't a thing until it was my ninth or whatever yeah. release mm -hmm. um, so from a business perspective I did that correctly I, I just was not willing to give up yeah <laughs> and um, so like, I guess the only thing I would tell myself is like, good job for once. You're like, <laughs> yeah, like, you know, you're, you're really sure. Yeah. And there are going to be days when you ask yourself, like, why am I so sure? Mm -hmm. Like, is this a delusion? Yeah. And the answer is no. Yeah. Um, so good job. Keep going. Keep I mean, going. that is, that's my <laughs> advice to all writers yeah. is just keep going because, mm -hmm. um, I think you get caught thinking the thing you're writing is your only genius thing. And if yeah. that isn't your thing, then you'll never have another genius mm -hmm. idea. Just keep going. Yeah. There'll be a time for it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for meeting with me and talking oh, with no, me. Oh, thank you. I'm so excited to get to see literally all the millions of worlds that you're creating. There's so <laughs> many of them out there. <laughs> yes, I really look forward to making them. and, and So to... what, really quick, just to run it down for people. So the Atlas 6 paperback, September. Right. The Atlas Paradox, October. Alone with You in the Ether just got moved from the first week of December to the last week of November okay. um, to accommodate the UK or something like that. Um, then Masters of Death and uh, um, One for My Enemy are being re-released right. next year. So, so yeah. Yeah. That's so lots coming. Lots of stuff. Yeah. Lots of stuff. That's it. And I'll see you guys later. Bye. Bye. <laughs>